Hello and welcome to the Pipes at UR tutorial. I am Fabian and I will guide you through taking the first steps with the Pipes at UR model, which is an open optimization model of the European power transmission system. I am a PhD student in the group of Tom Brown at the Institute of Automation and Applied Informatics at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. By the end of this presentation, I would like you to have an overview from the graphical introduction to Pipes OER, which I will give in the following slides, for you to have an appreciation for workflow management systems. And I also hope that you will be enthusiastic about using Pipes OER for your own projects. I will start with a brief introduction into long-term investment planning problems, because these are the motivation and foundation of why we are building this Pipes OER model. To find cost-effective future energy systems, researchers usually put together large-scale optimization problems, which minimize both the investments and the short-term costs. So in this optimization problem, we have an objective to minimize the annual system costs, which is comprised of the annualized capital costs of investments, such as in generation infrastructure, storage infrastructure, and transmission infrastructure. And we co-optimize all of these at the same time because they are strongly interacting and there are a lot of trade-offs to consider. Additionally, we might have some marginal costs from remaining fossil fuel generators originating from the fuel costs. This objective is subject to quite a few constraints and I will give just a brief outline so one of these is meeting the energy demand at each node, so this could be a particular region, and also for each point in time, so this could be an hour of the year. Additionally, we have transmission constraints for moving power between the nodes, and we usually use a linearized power flow model. Moreover, we have constraints regarding the availability of variable renewables, so these also are spatially and temporally varying. That's why we have to consider these for each node and each point in time, and we usually derive them from weather data. Moreover, we consider that we have geographic potential and limits for building renewables. As we are designing future energy systems, we have to make sure that these systems are not only cost optimal, but also fulfill CO2 re emission reduction targets and these go in as another constraint. The main point why I'm showing this slide is that a lot of these constraints to accurately build them, they need a lot of data and they don't only need raw data, but also process data and aggregated data. And this is what we understand as data-driven modeling. And there are a couple of problems with it that we repeatedly encounter. First of all, there are many different data sources coming from different organizations, uh, coming in different file types, in different file formats, and even once read in, many of these data sources need cleaning and processing before we can use them. And once the models become more complex and grow, we create intermediate data sets and scripts and often in these cases, the dependencies are not quite clear. So on the data side, we don't really know what script is requiring which files as an input and produces which outputs. And also on the software side, we ideally want to know which packages we have to have installed to be able to run a particular script. What this boils down to is that we want to be able to reproduce our results and not only reproduce them, but also we want to make it as easy as possible to run many parametric scenarios for the same model. For example, we want to sweep across the parameter space using different cost assumptions for solar, for wind, and for transmission expansion. And what we need for this is a workflow management tool. And there happens to be a very Pythonic workflow management tool, which is called SnakeMake. Here's a miniature example 
of a snake make workflow there are two rules my task and my plot which we define in a text file which is called a snake file and each of these rules defines inputs outputs and a script which takes the inputs and produces the outputs and as you see when you look at the output of the first task it is the input of the second task the rule my task will produce a file result sample.txt which will then be processed by the rule my plot um, to produce a figure. And to execute this, we um, run a command snake make and attach the file name, which is figures, and a choice for the sample variable, which is indicated by the curly brackets. So we could write great stuff.pdf, and what we would have to provide in this case is the input data for the first task, namely data slash great stuff dot txt. So far this was a very general introduction into the snake make workflow, which leads us to the question what is pipes at your specifically? And the short answer is it's a workflow to build a model of the European power system from open data. It covers the whole NCE area and contains, for example, the AC lines at and above 220 kV, uh, the substations and also HVDC links, planned or existing. It also includes a database of conventional power plants, time series for electrical demand, time series for variable renewable generator availability, so the spatial temporal, spatial -temporal capacity factors, and also the geographic potentials for the expansion of wind and solar power. So basically it creates all the data that is needed to formulate the optimization problem which I introduced earlier. The main features of Pipes AUR uh, that is it only uses freely available and open data and it has a automated and highly configurable software pipeline from raw, raw data to the optimized electricity system. We can achieve high temporal resolution, so hourly for a complete year, and also high spatial resolution, going from the full network resolution that NCOE transparency map provides up to a one node per country model. Before I dive into the details of the snake make workflow, I would like to briefly outline what is configurable. The configuration settings are maintained in a config.yaml file, which is kind of a text-based dictionary, and we will later see how it looks exactly. By default, uh, pipes that you are uses the whole NCOE area, but it is also possible to select only a subset of countries which should be represented in the model. So it's, for example, you could run a Germany only model or a Germany only model with um, its neighboring countries. It is also possible to select a particular reference year. Um, by default, Pipes at UR, um, provides you with a data set of the year 2013 of the ERA5 and SARA2 data sets but it is also possible to choose within the broad spectrum of years provided by these data sources. I believe these are at the moment from 1997, from 1979 to 2019. It is also possible to specify a CO2 budget so you can run from 80% to 95% and up to 100% CO2 emission reduction as I alluded to in the selection of countries before, it is also possible to very flexibly tweak uh, the spatial and temporal, temporal resolution of the model. So with regards to the temporal resolution, you could aggregate from an hourly resolution to a two hourly or three hourly resolution, um, getting more and more inaccurate, but uh, saving computation time. To save computation time, it is also very important to tweak the spatial resolution. Pipes at UR provides a network clustering functionality which allows you to pick any number of nodes between 
the full resolution of the model, which is around 6,000 nodes, down to 37 nodes, which is uh, one node for each country and synchronous zone. Of course, all the techno-economic parameters, such as the cost assumptions and also the types of wind turbines and solar panels that should be built in the model can be modified flexibly. It is also very easy to define um, types of land according to the Korean Land Cover database, which are eligible for a technology to be built. And you can also add distance criteria in the configuration settings. And with regards to solving the actual optimization model, it is also your choice to pick a solver of your liking. For the smaller problems, you can still uh, run the model with an open source solver, such as CBC. But for the bigger problems, you will likely have to turn to a commercial solver, such as Gurobi or Cplex. So now we can slowly progress to the core of this tutorial. And don't be afraid, I will show this complicated view at the beginning to break it down for you in the following sections. What you see here is a graphical unpacking of this PipeSciUR workflow up until the clustering, so not including the solving yet. And each of the boxes represents a rule. And these rules are connected by arrows, which um, represent an output of one rule flowing to the input of another rule. And as you see, this is very complex. So I boiled it down to a simplified view, uh, which we will follow in this tutorial and basically consists of four steps. So first we prepare a Pipesa network, which includes all the data processing and create a detailed but complete model. In the next step, we simplify the pipes and network. This includes the clustering, which I mentioned, before passing it to the solver in the third step. In the fourth step, there are a couple of rules uh, to summarize, um, but we will not go into detail of the this fourth section. Before starting to prepare the model, we have to retrieve a couple of data bundles which we put together for your ease of use and our ease of maintenance. The rule retrieve data bundle uh, collects data such as the NUTS3 shapes, country and EZ shapes, Korine land cover, the Natura 2000 datasets of natural protection areas, a GAPCO bathymetry dataset, historical load and hydro data, as well as population and GDP data based on the NUTS3 regions and downloading this dataset from Zenodo is required and uh, sums up to 1.4 gigabytes of data. On the other hand, there's the rule retrieve cutout, which also from Zenodo uh, downloads subsets of the weather data from the ERA-5 reanalysis dataset and the SARA-2 solar surface radiation data for the year 2013. If you want to use other years, um, you can use the also optional rule build cutout, which does the same process that was used to create the retrieve cutout dataset, which you download. And we um, provide this cutout nonetheless, because it's easy to get started and you need APIs access to download data from ERA-5. This dataset is substantially larger and accumulates to about four gigabytes of data. Having downloaded the datasets, we can start preparing the networks. And we start out by retrieving the polygons for each country in the build shapes rule. And then we construct a base power network with buses, transformers, HVAC lines, and HVDC li links in the base network rule. In the base network rule, we take as an input the answer E map on their transparency flat platform and process them with the grid kit tool and additionally add projects from the 10 year network development plan of 2018. The latest extract we have is from the 12th of January 2020 and this is what it looks like as a pipeside network 
and restore this data either as a CSV file or a NetCDF file. With the information of the base network, we can assess what substations, uh, resources that we built in a particular region are likely going to be connected. We make use of these Voronoi cells and we attach resources always to the closest node. And we will use these Voronoi cells throughout to aggregate the assessment of wind resource, solar resource, as well as demand, and so forth. And this rule, which processes the base network and produces the Voronoi cells, is called build bus regions. And we do that for both onshore regions as well as offshore regions shown outside. With these Voronoi cells, we build renewable profiles for each of these cells, um, which includes the per unit availability time series or capacity factors for each of the carriers wind, onshore and offshore, as well as solar and hydropower plants. This calculation also includes the assessment of the land availability. So for each Voronoi cell, we will get a percentage of the area which is available for a particular carrier. And the rules which combine this process are the build cutout rules, which downloads the weather data sets, the build Natura raster, which processes the Natura 2000 natural protection areas, the build renewable profiles rules themselves, and we have to handle some cases differently for the hydro profiles. That's why we have a, another explicit rule here. The build renewable profiles rule um, can run for all three solar, onshore wind and offshore wind separately. We will start looking at the calculation of the land availability and then in a second step look at the time series generation for the renewables. For the assessment of the land availability, we use a tool from colleagues of the Forschungszentrum Jülich, or Research Center in Jülich, which is called Geospatial Land Availability for Energy Systems, or short GLAZE. Also open source, available and developed by Severin Ryberg. Basically, we take each of the Voronoi cells and overlay it with uh, the Korine land cover, the Natura 2000 natural protection areas. For the offshore regions, we also use a bathymetry dataset, uh, GAPCO 2018, to assess what area in each Voronoi cell is available. So in this example here, for an onshore wind available areas in one particular cell, you can see that quite a lot, 86% is included, either to eligibility codes, so um, yeah, you couldn't build a wind turbine in cities, and also due to distance criteria, so distances that you have to keep from villages or buildings or natural protection areas. We use this area to multiply it with a capacity per uh, area uh, to retrieve a value uh, how many megawatts or gigawatts we can build in a particular cell and this is our potential for this cell which goes into the optimization model. Because the weather data for example from era 5 is not represented by our Voronoi cells but on a 30 by 30 kilometer grid across Europe we can also express our geographic potentials as shown for onshore wind in this example on this grid. But um, we can also overlay our Voronoi cells here and get our description of the available er or eligible area in terms of our Voronoi cells. We can do the same for solar. So here we have the representation of the geographic potential in megawatts on the era 5 grid cells, which we can use for weighting the grid cells uh, when aggregating the weather data, the time varying weather data later. 
as well, we can overlay our Voronoi cells in this case and aggregate from the grid to the Voronoi cells. So we have one value for each of the Voronoi cells. The solar and onshore wind data is referring to onshore data sets, but we also have offshore wind split into AC connection, so connected via AC lines and also via DC lines. So if you look at the AC lines here in green, we have connections closer to the shore. There's a distance limit uh, where the split is between AC and DC connection. And when we aggregate overlay our Voronoi cells of the offshore regions, then we get some value for each of the Voronoi cells. We can do the same for offshore wind DC. We can see quite a lot in the North Sea region further from the shore where we don't connect via AC lines. And we do the same overlay here and get a value for each Voronoi cell. Now, having established how much capacity we can build in each of the Voronoi cells, we also need to assess the temporal characteristics for each of these Voronoi cells and for each of the technologies. And as I alluded to multiple times already, we use the reanalysis weather data from ERA5 and SERA2, uh, which gives us values for up to 40 years on a 30 by 30 kilometer basis um, for values such as the direct influx of the sun, which is determining the output of solar panels uh, shown on the top left here. And for the same period, we see the wind at uh, 100 meters for the whole of Europe, uh, which is determining the output of wind turbines. You also see um, that we have very different patterns for solar and uh, wind, which can be quite useful when integrating the renewables. We have um, our own library, um, which processes this weather data into energy systems data. So energy systems data in this case would be a per unit availability time series of a particular carrier at a particular location. So what we take is we for the solar, we take the influx um, or the rate solar radiation, um, apply solar panel models with a lot of uh, wrangling with the orientations and the materials and efficiencies and uh, get a per unit time series for the solar. And also uh, we do principally the same uh, with onshore, offshore uh, wind turbines. We take the wind speeds at a particular region. We apply a wind turbine model consisting of a power curve, which relates the wind speeds to the power output. And also consider things like the surface rough roughness, which um, can decrease uh, the wind speed at hub height. So far, we have processed data relating to the transmission network and also to um, the re renewable energy carriers. Additionally, we can also add existing fossil fuel power plants uh, in the build power plants rule. And we have another tool, power plant matching, which merges data sets of conventional power plants and produces one cleaned data set, the results of which you see on the map. So you have different technologies such as nuclear, lignite, natural gas, hard coal, oil and waste and other, and how they are distributed and what capacities they have. Uh, there's also data on commissioning and retrofitting years as well as an assignment to the closest substation of the base network or the Voronoi cells that we already have. The add electricity rule is the rule that ties together all what we've done beforehand. We add loads, we add the generators uh, with their renewable profiles and also the fossil fuel generators to the base network and store them all in a single Pipesign Network NetCDF file. And what we come up with in the end is a European transmission network with about 5,000 buses, 9,600 aggregated generators, 
So each Voronoi cell will only have one uh, aggregated generator of each carrier. So one generator of onshore wind per Voronoi cell. Uh, about 6,000 AC lines above 220 kV, as well as 60 HVDC links, uh, where we also differentiate between those that are planned and those that are already existing. Each node has a load time series, an availability time series, and a potential for each carrier of solar and onshore wind and offshore wind, as well as hydrogen storage and batteries. Okay, and that's the first step, preparing the pipes and network completed. Good on you for staying on for so long already. And there's only two more steps to go. And the next of which is to simplify the pipes and network. So what is the idea of simplifying the network or the motivation for simplifying the network? Um, the main motivation is to make the problem less computationally challenging so that we are able to co-optimize uh, generation, storage, and transmission capacities. And this simplification basically consists of four steps, and it starts with transforming all the transmission lines to 380 kilovolt lines equivalent and remove dead ends. And then in a the second step, cluster the network with a k-means algorithm. The last two steps are basically preparation steps for creating the optimization problem, which adds additional components which are only needed after the clustering, so which are not affected by the clustering. And also the prepare network rule adds some of the system-wide constraints and also aggregates the temporal resolution. But the focus here is definitely on the first two to simplify and cluster the network, which I will show now. So on the left hand side, you see uh, the picture of the network, which you have seen throughout this presentation already quite a lot. And you see that we basically have three different voltage levels represented 220, 300 and 380 kV. And on the right hand side, you see the output of the simplify network rule. So we have lifted all of the transmission lines to 380 kilovolt equivalents. And we have also removed uh, the dead ends. The most important step to make our problems computationally tractable is the cluster network rule. And on the bottom right, you see a schematic illustration, but I will click through different clustering levels, starting with 512 buses to show you what aggregation levels are possible and see how the Voronoi cells uh, change. So we start with uh, 512 buses and uh, go down to 256 buses, 128 buses, for which it still can make sense to use the linearized power flow. But then this is the minimum uh, spatial resolution, one node per country and synchronous zone, for which it is probably due to the length of the lines not advisable to use the linear, linearized power flow anymore. So when we come back now to this complicated view of the workflow, you will see some familiar rules already. We have talked about the build power plants rule. We have talked about uh, retrieving the data bundle, building the shapes, building the base network. From that, building the bus regions and using these bus regions, as well as the Natura raster, uh, the cutouts um, from two different sources. So here, ERA5 and SARA2 uh, to produce uh, the renewable profiles for on-wind, AC-connected offshore wind, DC-connected offshore wind, solar, and also build the hydro profiles. Um, you can see very nicely that all of this comes very neatly together in the add electricity rule, uh, whose output is then used to further simplify and cluster the network. And this combines both steps, prepare and simplify the network. And in the following, we will uh, devote our attention to solving the optimization problem for which we have now built all the data uh, that we need. 
So the next question is, how do we manage multiple scenarios at once in the SnakeMake workflow? We might want to run multiple different settings at the same time and not wait for one job to finish until we can start the other one. The nice feature of SnakeMake is that you can define meta rules, such as in this case, solve all ELEC networks which collects a set of scenarios, which we can define in the config.yaml. So by issuing this single command, we can run many different scenarios at once. So in this example here, we go from the simplification stage and cluster the network to different spatial resolutions, because we might want to see um, how changing or reducing the spatial resolution changes our results. In another layer, we might want to see how changing the temporal res resolution from an hourly model to a three hourly model uh, changes our results. And we want to do that for all the combinations of spatial and temporal aggregation. And this single command, uh, you can just run all of these scenarios at once. We also have to talk a little bit about the computational requirements and the performance of pipes that you are. In terms of requirements, so for the first two steps that I presented, the preparation and the simplification, so not the solving, these can be run locally. However, uh, you will need access to a commercial solver and a cluster for larger problems Spatial and temporal resolution affect the solving time and the memory consumption. We have two examples here. A 200 node model at a two hourly resolution will consume about 28 gigabytes of RAM in peak and take about 12 hours to solve. And there's also some solver settings where you can tweak and depending on your optimality and feasibility tolerances, this can be reduced or increased a little bit, but that's the general order of magnitude. Uh, likewise, for a smaller 100 node model at a three hourly resolution, this would consume typically around eight gigabytes of RAM and take about 90 minutes to solve. So this is already in the realm uh, now, which you can solve on a local computer for just for testing. Um, last but not least, um, a short note on the installation and the dependencies. So we provide an environment.yaml uh, with the repository and you can install um, all the necessary packages uh, with Conda. If you are not familiar with Conda, Conda is a, a package manager for Python uh, packages and also beyond. And in this table below, there's listed vital packages Pipesite UR depends on. So this is on the one hand, it's Pipesite itself. We've talked about Adlite and power plant matching, Adlite for um, downloading the weather data and processing the weather data, and power plant matching for adding a data set of fossil fuel power plants. Uh, SnakeMake Minimal is, uh, or SnakeMake is also uh, obviously a package uh, that we have to install and we have Pandas, GeoPandas, X-Array uh, for data tables and also PyProj, Libgedel and Cartopy for the geographical information that we process and also visualize. I've also talked about the Glaze package. Um, additionally, you will need to install a solver, so open source solver, CBC, or commercial solvers like Gurobi and Cplex. The installation instructions vary a little bit or vary a lot actually, depending on what operating system you are using. So that's why I won't provide um, a detailed um, tutorial here, but you are referred to the um, documentation which has some information on installing these solvers. So the last question maybe is how, how do we make sure that all of these, um, yeah, all of this and all the whole workflow is working for others where people use many different operating systems like a Linux based system, uh, Mac or Windows. And the answer is that we use continuous integration testing with Travis, uh, which tells us if anything on a particular platform is, is breaking. 
So obviously a model can always be improved and we have a list of things that we plan to do and uh, you're more than welcome to uh, contribute and ask questions and uh, report feedback on how you liked using Pipes at UR. If you made it until here, you deserve a prize. But all I have is a couple of more links which you can follow and indulge in some additional material. Um, please be referred to the documentation of Pipes at UR, but also of the underlying um, Pipes at toolbox, which um, handles the data and the communication with the solvers. And if you have any questions or feedback, uh, please report it to the Google group of Pipesa, uh, where we are very happy to answer your questions and give guidance and ideas for any issues that you might have. Also, uh, what you might like as you've listened to an introduction into an open optimization model is the Open Mod Initiative which is a grassroots initiative that supports open source, open data, and also open publishing.